last years of life. In 1609, the servants of the king purchased the Blackfriars Theatre for their winter performances. EGOT Theatre belonged to closed theatres. This was due to a higher entrance fee for the more prosperous public. The success of the play was decided not by a noisy crowd of people, as it was in the globe, which belonged to public, public theatres, but connoisseurs of the elegant. In the years of political reaction that came into the reign of King James I, the closed theatres began to gradually gain control over public theatres, and that the performances of closed theatres, the influence of the tastes of the court aristocratic circles is becoming more and more clear. In light of all this, it is significant that in 1609 the troupe to which Shakespeare belonged invited two new playwrights, Beaumont and Fletcher, to the permanent work. They were young people of aristocratic origin and aristocratic tastes. Creativity them, in comparison with the work of Shakespeare, is external, formal. The plays of Beaumont and Fletcher are based mainly on witty situations, and not on the depth of content and not on the realistic integrity of the images. Beaumont and Fletcher were, to some extent, Harbingers of that light, superficial but brilliant drama that flourished in London at the end of the 17th century, the so-called Restoration Age, and whose most prominent representatives were Congreve and Wycherley. There were many people who preferred Beaumont and Fletcher to Shakespeare. Shakespeare was boring compared to you, wrote the poet Cartwright in 1647, referring in verse to Fletcher's shadow. In the fact that the theatre went along Shakespeare's foreign path, moving away from full-blooded realism and from the public viewer, from what Shakespeare's work was based on, it seems, we should look for the most plausible answer to the question of why Shakespeare in 1612, after the creation of the storm, almost completely broke with the theatre and retired to his native Stratford. Here he spent the last years of his life. As a shareholder of the theatre, he made up a pretty considerable fortune. He owned one of the best houses in Stratford. According to his first biographer, Rowe, 1709, he spent the last years of his life in contentment, solitude and conversations with friends. Is this an idyllic picture of reality? Was he internally happy? On this account, we can only make assumptions. Apparently, he was drawn to the theatre. In 1613 he visited London. It is possible that this cooperation with Fletcher in the creation of the play, Henry VIII and, as some researchers believe, plays, Two Noble Cousins is connected with this visit to the capital. During his stay in London, he performed the next order. March 24. 1613 solemnly celebrated the 10th anniversary of the reign of King James I. On this occasion, for aristocratic youth, a night tournament was organized. The shield of each participant of the tournament, according to custom, was painted with emblematic figures, under which stood a corresponding motto. The young Count Ritland, who had recently inherited the title, was an ardent theater lover and promoter of actors, like his predecessor in title that Earl of Ridland, who was at one time credited with Shakespeare's plays, see chapter XXV. The question of authorship he ordered to paint his shield Richard Burbage, who, in addition to the skill of the tragic actor, also painted a painter. To compose the same motto he ordered William Shakespeare. From the surviving account book of the graph it is clear that Burbage and Shakespeare received 54 shillings for this work. During his stay in London, Shakespeare bought a house in the Blackfriars area for a large sum of £140 sterling. In November 1614, Shakespeare, as is evident from the surviving diary of his relative Thomas Green, again visited London. These were, probably, rare visits that violated seclusion in Scrutford. Shakespeare, judging by some, however, very vague, given, took part in the life of his native city. In 1611, he donated money to improve roads. In 1614, 
The Bedford townspeople were thrilled that the local landowners of Combo were planning to enclose a section of the Strathian communal lands. As far as can be judged by the fragmentary data, Shakespeare was one of those who strove to settle the matter with the world. March 25, 1616 Shakespeare signed his will, which caused and causes so much controversy and bewilderment among the biographers of the great playwright. The Shakespeare's Tomb and Bust in Stratford-on-Avon The main part of the state Shakespeare hung his daughter Suzanne Hall, the wife of a doctor. Another daughter, Judith, he left 300 pounds sterling in money and a goblet of gilded silver. He left his wife and Shakespeare, a bed for quality and quality with a mattress, pillows, blankets, and nothing more. True, biographers comfort us by the fact that Anna Shakespeare was still provided, as she received by law for life a third of the income from the immovable property of her deceased husband. But till Shakespeare could add a few kind words here, as was usually done in wills. In addition, when buying the house we mentioned in the Blackfriars area, Shakespeare, with a separate reservation in the deed of the fortress, deprived his wife of the right to use the proceeds from this house. All this seems to indicate the discord between Shakespeare and his wife. But, on the other hand, the old-timers and Struthers later told us that Anna Shakespeare urged her to be buried in the grave of her husband before her death. If Shakespeare was. There are no pages in the source book, 225-226, in the fact that from time to time from the graves pulled out the remains to make room for the new dead, and threw these remains into a common bone. Let us recall how the grave digger in Hamlet treats Yorick's skull unceremoniously. Looking at the skulls and bones that the grave digger throws out of the pit, the Prince of Denmark thinks with disgust and sorrow that bones may be made from these bones. My bones ache at the thought of it, says Hamlet. Obviously, this idea has long haunted Shakespeare. Verses over the grave of Shakespeare were the reason that even now his ashes still rest in a small, now numbering about 12,000 inhabitants, but famous in his name town Stratford and not moved to Westminster Abbey.